bunch of block science research, um, going over what is, who is block science, what do we do, uh, how do we do it, um, and a kind of brief glimpse down the rabbit hole of some of the various research projects that are going on across block science and our, our collaborative ecosystem. Um, so starting with what, what is block science? So Ryan and I are here uh, from this innovative engineering R&D firm that specializes in complex systems. Um, we operate mostly as sort of semi-autonomous project groups, so it's sort of a sociocratic uh, model rather than a strict top-down corporate hierarchy type thing. Um, of course, with operations and communication support, which we've been really ramping up over the past couple of years. Um, and ultimately, the goal of block science, and this is uh, Dr. Michael Zargam's vision, is we're working towards the goal of bending the long arc of the future away from dystopia. So if this is the path of history so far, you know, we have potential futures that are more dystopian, potential futures that are more utopian, and we're essentially trying to exert forces to keep us away from dystopia. How can we use these tools for, um, you know, human emancipation rather than uh, hyper-financial capitalist speculation sort of thing. So, uh, and that said, Web3 isn't the only uh, design area of block science, um, but it is one of the sort of most uh, high use case areas for complex system design and token simulation and whatnot. So, um, so yeah, that's a little about what we do uh, as, or who we are. Um, what we do, um, I tried to categorize sort of some different um, areas that we work in. So we do a lot of blue sky research, which is also our internal R&D. Um, things like CAD-CAD uh, was a, essentially an internal uh, tool that was developed to help block science engineers do their own modeling and eventually we spun it out as its own open source um, ecosystem. So aside from you know, our, our internal R&D, and sorry for all the acronyms here, there's a lot of words behind those letters, but we'll get into those later in the, uh, in the deck. Um, we also do client design projects, so we've talked a bit about some of our design work with Holochain. Um, some of you may know we do some design work with Filecoin, with the IGZO Foundation, with the Red Cross, with a number of different clients uh, on various um, design challenges. Um, we also do some venture science, so rather than venture capital, where you're investing capital to get more capital, we like venture science, so we're investing both capital and sort of scientific knowledge, but the goal is to um, create these sometimes product spin-outs or open source uh, packages that we can you know, improve the open source science tools that are available, so we're trying to invest science and capital to produce more science rather than just capital to produce more capital, because What's the point of that? Um, so a lot of these projects have spun out of block science. Um, Balancer, some of you guys may know, is a sort of multi-dimensional Uniswap, um, so a big um, bonding curve or automated market maker platform. Block Science Labs is also a new spin out from block science. It's sort of like a uh, modeling platform, so like CAD-CAD as a service. Um, a lot of people found it difficult to do independent modeling environments with CAD-CAD, installing everything from the get-go. So Block Science Labs is a, a forthcoming platform, essentially, that you can have team-based complex system models, so everyone is working on the same model rather than everyone running your own model locally. And we've, we've just had a lot of difficulties, again, sort of in our internal R&D. Um, so some of the spin-outs from Block Science there. Um, we also focus a lot on these open science initiatives. Um, so we collaborate with a number of communities in Web3 space, Token Engineering, Commons, and Academy doing education materials. Uh, we also have some internships from the Token Engineering Academy um, courses. Um, a lot of the um, research that you may see here, you've probably heard deployed in the common stack, whether it's conviction voting, bonding curves, stuff like that. That's all essentially block science IP that is being pushed into the open source domain and tried to make applicable for communities that can use these tools. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, a, a more recent sort of uh, angle of, of block science work um, is doing some DAO ethnography, which is really quite interesting, and sort of governance audits. We've worked with a couple of um, communities now essentially doing um, computer-aided governance, uh, which we'll again walk through in a little bit, sort of using these processes and using um, you know, computational models to uh, essentially feedback on communities' governance processes and, and suggest improvements or, um, or fixes. Um, cool, so we'll, we'll try not to go da too far down the rabbit hole. Each of these is kind of its own research arc, so we're going to try to introduce a bunch of these research arms, and if there's interest in some in particular, uh, we can dive into more details perhaps in another session or in uh, breakout sessions throughout the rest of the week. 
but we'll just give you sort of an introduction to uh, some of the research arcs going on. So uh, generalized dynamical systems, actually if any of you have seen me hiding on my computer the last few days, we just published this today. Uh, so this is a new um, mathematical framework to define complex adaptive systems. Uh, it's the work of Dr. Zargam and uh, Jamshid Shorish, Dr. Shorish, um, basically putting together the, the formalized mathematical no notation so that we can do sort of reliable complex systems modeling uh, and build out the, um, the ecosystem around that. Um, of course, that sort of paves the way for complex system modeling with CAD-CAD. CAD-CAD was open sourced a couple of years ago in collaboration with the Common Stack. Um, and the whole idea is how can we feed in data into these complex systems and have some um, sort of computational leverage in understanding big data and complex systems and how we can make uh, healthy, sustainable decisions with all of these variables and um, uh, sort of factors involved. It's worth saying that like CAD CAD is obviously been out for a while now, but there's a new version of CAD CAD coming out which is very much shifting the foundations onto this now like pretty finalized like formal mathematical foundation. Mm -hmm. For those in the audience who aren't familiar with the acronym, CAD is? CAD CAD stands for Complex Adaptive Dynamics Computer Aided Design. So like AutoCAD for physical systems, CAD CAD is for dynamic evolutionary systems that may involve humans and tokens and uh, different rights and affordances. So thanks for that. Um, one of the other research arcs that we are pushing forward is uh, something we call CATS, or Content Addressable Transformers. Um, and you can kind of think of this, I mean, the, the purpose is for verifiable data provenance for complex system modeling. So for any computational biologist in the room, for example, if you're running uh, a big data model using you know, various um, assumptions, weightings, optimizations, and you're starting with an initial data set and you run it through the model, you receive a final data set. What's really important for doing this in large distributed communities is that you have provenance of your data trail. So this is kind of like a blockchain of every step of the data and its transformation through your model. So you can see what people started with, what their assumptions were, what their optimizations were, and carry that data provenance chain through your model. So at the end of your model, you not only have the result, but you also have the data provenance chain of everything that happened to that data so that you can more uh, easily open up sort of the um, citizen science or collective intelligence on how we use these models to make decisions about uh, how we move forward as a collective. Uh, a few more topics here, we'll just breeze through and then we'll dive into each one in a little bit more detail. Um, commons market makers, we've talked about this a number of times during the week, sort of like the augmented bonding curve from the common stack or the hollow fuel reserve accounts, some interesting design work going on there. Um, ARMS or automated regression markets, I think we made a, a brief mention yesterday. Um, they're sort of a market maker for semi-fungible assets. So things like carbon credits where you have um, different properties, like some carbon credits are produced in North America versus Europe versus Asia. Some carbon credits are produced by solar or tidal or wind. So you have these sort of like semi-fungible where some credits are the same, some credits are different depending on your attributes. So an arm could be, for example, uh, a way to manage assets that are semi-fungible um, for investors who want to buy, for example, Canadian solar credits instead of just credits in general, so sort of getting into more sophisticated um, multi-attribute market makers. Um, Alpha Bonds was a design project with uh, the IXO Foundation. It's basically a dynamic bonding curve that responds to a risk parameter, so there's sort of a, a prediction market inside the, the bonding curve and you have a, uh, a risk parameter for how your social impact bond is uh, evolving over time. Uh, and finally, one of the uh, areas that uh, Orion is, is focusing on is the sort of knowledge commons. How do we maintain, preserve, and uh, you know, have access to all of these rabbit holes of data, even internally within block science, all of our engineering diagrams, the, you know, there's just so much mani um, knowledge management to um, uh, keep up with. So we have essentially someone working specifically on the knowledge commons first internally, and we hope also to make that an external resource that uh, the larger token engineering and so on communities can use to upskill in some of these tools. Yeah, like it's, it's internal R&D which has these kinds of near term practical applications for the needs of block science, but the, the kind of long horizon goal is like to, to support that in, in the ways that we want to do commons, right? Like we want to be able to that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay, so we'll, we'll take a few steps down the rabbit hole of some of these uh, concepts, and if we want to do more um, in-depth discussions, we can do those as breakout call uh, discussions or sessions throughout the week. Um, so a little bit more on GDS. Um, it's essentially a, a math framework or a template to define these dynamical systems uh, whose states are influenced by agent decision making. So it's basically taking the existing control theoretic concepts and building on them um, so that we can use the, math, uh, the mathematical notation for rigorous definition of CAD-CAD models and uh, moving forward in the uh, complex system design process. It kind of does, like for the digital world, what dynamical systems did for like physical modeling, right? So you could take something like a solar system and all the planets moving around, we'd have formal maps for that, but we don't have good formal maps for the kinds of dynamical systems that we all, we all take care about. Right? So really what this does is it, um, it separates the uh, the game rules from the agent behaviors within that game. So this allows us to move beyond these uh, oversimplified classical economic assumptions of, you know, static equilibria of systems or rational agents, um, whatever that is for those of you who have dip, dove down those rabbit holes. There are all sorts of false assumptions in classical economics that these tools will help us to uh, computationally move through some of these formerly intractable um, assumptions about how agents behave in systems. Um, so yeah, just a, a short little example. And I mean, if you're really interested, there's a, a paper and an article on the paper that just released today. So feel free to check that out. We also put out a short tweet thread um, trying to explain the, the gist of some of these topics. Yeah, so it's, as we said, it, it is a, um, it's for modeling co like complex dynamical systems. Um, unlike a lot of the other alternative frameworks you have there, it's incredibly um, general, right? So you can have, you can model a system <coughs> with a lot of different um, conceptual parts that would previously, you'd have to define things in this purely, I don't know, uh, like classical dynamical systems way, or you purely agent-based approach, um, and this like opens up that option to, yeah, to have modeling on your system. Right, so it helps us to separate those sort of micro levels from the meso levels from the macro levels. We can do multi-scale modeling. There's a lot of tools out there that do one type, whether it's agent-based or dynamical systems, and CAD-CAD is really this sort of um, multi-scale modeling tool that you can do um, yeah, much more um, integrated modeling. Um, so what, what does this enable us to do? Essentially, we want data-driven decision-making. So in a lot of systems, we have the, the engineer's loop, which is sort of the build loop, and the pilot's loop, which is sort of the, the driving loop. Um, and CAD-CAD sort of comes in here where we have these formalized abstractions, which use GDS to uh, you know, formally notate those. We plug those, that mathematics, into CAD-CAD models. Uh, and of course, we can integrate real-world data if we're running this as a digital twin beside the live system. Um, and we can query essentially CAD-CAD for computational projections saying if all these things are true and the agents have these types of actions available to them, what are our expected outcomes? And then we can use that to drive the system with more informed decisions uh, and designs. And of course, the, the loop continues. It's not just a deploy and done. There's a continual um, sort of uh, iterative process within the engineering lifecycle, but uh, using CAD-CAD specifically to um, continue to drive those um, uh, purposeful action. Um, so the, the gap that CAD-CAD fills, as Orion mentioned, there's a ton of different modeling tools out there, um, but most of them focus on specific types of modeling. So what CAD-CAD does is offer a framework where we, we can bring in all of these um, scikit-learn, scipy, numpy, et cetera, um, into you know, a really robust modeling framework for complex systems. Python, like we're trying to integrate, like it's not, you don't 
don't have to buy into an entirely new thing, right? Like whatever you're doing, the, the hope is that it can help if you, if you have a need for it, right? Right. So this is a quick uh, diagram. What do we mean by multi-scale models? So essentially models that have spatial components, temporal components, topological components, uh, and of course being able to switch between these in different uh, modeling modes is where CAD-CAD is really uh, a strong uh, complex systems modeling tool. Um, and what does that look like in the projects that we do? So you can see on the left here, this is a SEIR model. It's an um, uh, infection uh, model for studying uh, virus pathologies and so on. So you can see the code on the left, um, what this, the outputs that this gives us. Sometimes we have you know, agents on the left, proposals on the right. Uh, yeah, actually that's from conviction voting, I think. And here's one of the uh, outputs of um, predator-prey model. So understanding sort of different uh, agent pop populations. Pardon me. Um, so yeah, some of the um, uh, types of things that we can do with CAD-CAD. And of course, this is more on the design side. The, the engineers of the system are looking at these kinds of charts. But we have to be realistic that the communities that we're working with in DAOs probably aren't going to be deep in these kinds of design charts. Just so back on to oh, yeah, yeah. Just to be sure. clear, um, these are three different things. This is not three different views on the same project. Yes. These are different examples for different projects. Yes. Um, so how do we make these sort of tools more accessible for communities, for DAOs that want to use um, CAD-CAD for computational modeling but don't have necessarily the, the full uh, background in data science and complex system modeling, et cetera? Um, so we came up with something called the CAG map, Computer Aided Governance Map and Process. Um, and essentially it, <laughs> it yeah. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have little uh, naming parties now. This was uh, Barada at, at Block Science came up with this, um, actually off of Brian Douglas's map of, um, uh, do you remember what that was? Uh, anyway, it was a really, basically trying to, to um, turn this into a process and a continuously iterative process, of course, where a community can observe their system, ask questions of it, map, sorry, the resolution, you can dig in deeper when I share the, the files. Um, you map your system, modeling it, understanding the, what comes out of your model, there's CAD-CAD there, presenting that to your community, debating whether you know, this is the right way to move forward, enacting those uh, policies, and then monitoring them and making sure that they're doing what you wanted them to do. So this is essentially a, a process that a community can uh, iteratively go through around any number of choices. Do we want to raise our exit tax? Do we want to change our subscription fee? Do we want to do anything? You can basically use CAD-CAD models to run um, data-assisted experiments and then make better decisions as a community how you want to iterate the various parameters of your DAO or economic system. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, in this piece here, we run through a couple of examples. Um, yeah, so that's basically how we're trying to ease the UX of CAD-CAD so it's not all engineering focus and it's also, you know, sort of community introspective and bringing more people into the process. Uh, because there's, a, there's an inherent trade-off between being inclusive and informed in a group. You can have a very small group that's informed well, but the more inclusive you are, the less everybody can be informed about the relevant topics. So, with this type of tool, we're trying to cut down on that trade-off where we can have larger groups be more inclusive and yet have people informed using computational data processes. Um, so we'll dive a little bit into content addressable transformers. This also dropped just last week, I think, so feel free to check out the article or the tweet thread. Um, but essentially, these offer transparent, uh, verifiable, and reliable data provenance in models. So you can kind of think of it of as like a blockchain, so each block is linked to the next, but what's in that block is all of your data, the transformation, the assumptions, the optimizations, all of your um, uh, sort of metadata, uh, and that gets linked into a chain of evidence so you can verify that essentially the data provenance chain was unbroken and we can trust the results of XYZ big data model in computational biology, for example. And this is also <coughs> allows you to get the provenance and, and that stuff, but you can use some of the older, you know, like you can just use Python libraries. Like you can build up, you can have your own tech stack. It doesn't have to be all Web3, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, this could even you know, improve bug reporting. Is there anyone who's filled out a bug report and they say, what device were you on? What operating right. system were you using? What browser were you on? What's this? What's that? A cat could, in theory, package all that information right into your bug report so that the, you, it, you don't have to push that onto the user. You're just basically uh, tracking that provenance chain. So lots of applications. This is very early stage research. Um, the code is uh, open source, so you can see it on the repo, and it will be available to play with fairly soon for anybody who's so inclined. Um, here's a, a quick um, diagram of a cat. Um, you <laughs> so it does make use of some uh, Web2 uh, data stack. We have input data, um, which gets stored on a C uh, content addressed uh, IPFS link, so content addressing versus location addressing. I know these are a lot of terms we're throwing at you. Uh, you can read more about it in the article. Um, but basically, it, it maintains all of the uh, internal um, sort of data provenance, and what comes out is uh, this chain of content that can be yeah, used to verify your provenance and so on. Cats. It's also worth noting, like the, this is both the design and the implementation of it, and I know that Josh is um, the, the main person working on this is not um, attached to some of these specifics, right? Like IPFS in this architecture like, could be something else. It can't be right now, but like it's generic and it's not tied to any of these products in there. Cool. Um, jumping into Commons Market Makers. We're probably going to do another session on this in a few days, so I won't go into too much detail, but these are also called bonding curves or automated market makers, essentially economic mechanisms that can be used for public goods provision. Um, the, the key trick to it is that we're kind of harnessing volatility to feed a common pool. So if anyone's familiar with Eleanor Ostrom, you know common pool resources, CPRs. Um, this is basically a smart contract suite that creates your common pool and a reserve pool and funds can come into the reserve and tokens are issued in supply to people who use them. Maybe we pay each other for local services, et cetera. Every time people buy or sell, some of the funds go into the common pool and the common pool can be allocated according to how everyone votes with these tokens. Um, so the tokens essentially collectively steer your common pool resource. Um, so what, what does that actually do for us? It's interesting because there will be maybe people who are interested in selling the tokens to reclaim the capital. Let's say if the price goes up, people may want to reclaim some of their initial investment. They sell uh, to reclaim that uh, capital from the reserve, which puts, which puts downward pressure on the price. But of course, those tokens are also good for steering your common pool. So the more people that leave, the fewer governors of the common pool there are, and the more funds are in the common pool. So there will be this opposing buy pressure where other people want to come in, not for the collateral value of the tokens, but for the governance value of the tokens. So this kind of creates some inherent volatility back and forth. There will be people buying and selling. And of course, volatility equals continuous funding in these systems because every time someone leaves, there's some exit tribute that flows from uh, the user or the reserve pool into the, the common pool. So it's kind of an economic game that acts like a, an engine to continuously generate funds uh, for a community endeavor. And actually going back to Grace's talk yesterday where we're talking about token price as a financial value versus what we do with, the, with our discretionary treasury, which is really real value. Uh, if you think of the, the common, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the commons market maker could be thought of like a pump. You know, the price goes up, the price goes down, but this isn't the be all end all. Ultimately what matters is that we're getting, we're filling up the common pool with the continuous fees and arbitrage opportunities in the CMM. You could also think of it kind of like a hydroelectric dam where you have uh, investments coming in, uh, also people selling from time to time. But what happens here is, you know, creating fees again for your common pool and your treasury so that you can do whatever you want to do in the world, whether that's plant trees or uh, feed anarchists or the long, the list goes on. Um, did you want to jump into arms or should I do that? Um, I think you should cover this because you're more familiar. I will yeah. also just say um, what we're augmenting with bonding curves, common mm. market makers, um, they're super, super cool. This debate on um, <laughs> the, the most memeable analogy has been one of the most consistent discussions that actually happens at Block Science since I've been there. And Jeff is definitely the one to, to talk to. I feel like <laughs> you, at this point you can answer like any question about these systems. And it's 
Definitely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but I know the people to ask, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. Um, so, brief touch on ARMS, um, so automated regression market makers, so uh, we've been working with uh, Hedera on their um, carbon energy market, and essentially they want something more sophisticated than just um, carbon credit pools, because credit pools can be very murky if all sorts of different uh, credits go into a pool, it's really hard to know if they're high quality, low quality, where they're from, what they're actually offsetting. Um, so this is a, a tool that can help to um, segregate these assets by their attributes, so where they were produced, what type they were produced, I mean the list goes on, you can have any number of attributes, and then you have sellers who are putting in certain attribute tokens and buyers who want to uh, buy or hold uh, different, you know, if you're a Canadian ESG group and you want to hold Canadian uh, energy credits, then the arm basically matches up across these various attributes to match buyers and sellers for um, more uh, sophisticated energy markets rather than lumping them all into, into one pool. Um, so a lot of cool stuff to explore there. Um, one other topic I'll, I'll briefly touch on before I turn it over to Orion is uh, the Alpha Bonds. This was a collaboration with the Ixo Foundation. They are working on social impact bonds. Um, but the problem with, I mean, there's several problems with social impact bonds. So this is essentially a bonding curve slash prediction mechanism that allows for local investment in uh, social impact or development impact and also has um, this sort of attestation primitive. So if the project is going well and people are attesting that they think it's going to succeed, uh, then this changes the, uh, the bonding curve price ratio. So essentially your bonding curve price responds to the risk dynamic, which is really important for investors in these types of initiatives. In current social impact bonds, there's very little visibility into the actual success uh, on the ground, so this is an attempt to use crypto economic mechanisms to lift that risk factor for uh, investors who can uh, support these kinds of development impact projects. 